Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillah, all praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions, his household. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us. And may Allah bless our offspring, those to come after us. May Allah keep them all steadfast on the deen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all Jannatul Firdaus. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, many times we find that younger people advise older people. And we've spoken about this, but we find that sometimes because of the age, the older people feel that the younger ones do not have the right to correct them. As a result, they don't learn. And as a result, they brush off sometimes that which is very, very important. Now, the example given of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam is a brilliant example in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spaced it out in many places in the Quran. In Surah Al-Shu'ara, which is the 26th Surah of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 69 makes mention of how Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was direct and very blunt with his father and with his people. His people meaning those whom he grew up with. He was still a young man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَ إِبْرَاهِيمِ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, read for them, read for the Quraysh, read for those who will listen to this Quran, the story with truth of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. Now this means that the version that the Quran has is the accurate version. It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell the people about the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. What about the story? Obviously there must be some aspect about it that Allah wants us to know. So Allah says, إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ When he asked his father and his people, what are you worshipping? He was a young man seeing them worshipping stones, worshipping idols, worshipping sticks, worshipping materialistic items, and he had questions. And these questions, the sad reality is when we are asked difficult questions by our children or by those who are younger than us, we brush them aside. Don't do that. Save yourselves by answering these questions. One of two things will happen. Either you will be able to convince the child that what you are saying is correct or the child might be able to convince you or make you think or as a result the studies that perhaps were caused by this question would then make you enlightened as to what is right and wrong. So don't be too embarrassed. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing a problem that was at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that problem continues and shall continue right up to the end. What is the problem? Sometimes we learn something, we learn it wrong. And we do it wrong and we continue doing it wrong. For generations we keep on teaching our children that which is wrong. And then there comes a time when someone says, hang on guys, have you thought about what you're doing? You know, I give you a simple example. Culture is something very good. If a person is cultured, they are supposed to be well-mannered. But sometimes culture comes with baggage from before that is wrong. For example, the abuse of a daughter-in-law happens to exist in a lot of cultures. A lot of cultures think that when a son gets married, that's a maid that has come into the house and she must take charge and do absolutely everything and then we can sit back, relax and dish out instructions no matter who we are. That is a dirty, unacceptable culture. It is filthy and we need to get rid of it. But the sad reality, we are so comfortable in it that when someone tells us that, look, this woman has a right, she is also a queen of the home, she has the right to her own abode, etc. We tend to say, no way. We're not going to take that. This is nonsense. If you leave the house, we're excommunicating you. This is what people say. Because they're in a comfort zone. It is very important to fulfill family rights and family ties and to serve your parents and to serve your in-laws. But it has to happen with mutual respect and with understanding, with happiness. 
I, through so many years of experience that I have as a counselor who helps people sometimes in their crises, I have found that those who live further away from their parents, in actual fact, have more love than those who live within the home. And this has happened in most cases. So if you were to help your children to actually live in an apartment across the road or somewhere in the suburb, in another part of the suburb or in another part of the city or somewhere else, perhaps the love that you will have may be much more than if you were to be in the same home throughout dishing instructions to one another and perhaps trampling on the toes of one another because you are independent people who think independently and you're trying after so many years to force this person to come into your rule when that really does not happen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So the point being raised is that which our forefathers have been doing, a lot of it is very good, but some of it might be unacceptable. We need to ask ourselves, the question, when our children ask ourselves or even within ourselves, if we go through a problem or an issue, we revisit this whole matter and we try and look into it and explain to the older people, look, we're not breaking the home here. We are actually making it. What is the point of physical togetherness when we are so disunited? I'd rather be physically far apart, one in Australia and one in New Zealand and one perhaps in Hawaii and the other one perhaps, you know, in Greenland. But they love each other. They get along with each other. They can't wait to see each other. Then people who live in the same home and they cannot wait to get away from each other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow upon us the common logic and the sense. I'm not at all encouraging that we just abandon our parents. But my parents, I have a very, very serious statement for you this evening. If you want your children or your in-laws to respect you, you need to deserve the respect. Don't abuse them. When you abuse, you don't deserve respect. Never did Allah say that you have to be obeyed when you are wrong. Many parents say, you know what, I need to be obeyed. Look at this man. He was Azar, the father of Ibrahim. Did he have to be obeyed? Not when he was wrong. No way. When he was wrong, you don't obey. There is no obedience for anyone when they are wrong. Whether it's your father or mother, no way. They cannot justify their misbehavior, their bad words, the swear words that come out of the mouths of some of the older people, the mothers and the fathers. A'udhu billah, you would never believe. And they expect the son to calm his wife down to say, listen, I'm your father, I'm your mother. Her, you can divorce. Me, you'll never be able to replace. Stop blackmailing your son. No way. You were wrong. If you want to be respected, you need to earn that respect. Live with respect. This is someone's child. It is going to be the mother of your grandchildren. Remember, my beloved parents, don't use the issue of Allah having told us that we need to serve our parents to get Jannah for you to abuse those children. You don't use that to abuse them. You cannot. If you want to get that Jannah, you also need to be a decent person. Go out of your way to make life easy for people. Then, wallahi, you will be respected. It will be a home filled with harmony and peace because you know, you know what? I am also a human being. I, I also owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my acts of worship and I owe the rest of human beings, the rest of humankind, starting with my own family, kindness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So Ibrahim alayhi salam asked his, his father and his people, what are you worshipping? It was blunt. It was straight. What did they say? They had a clear-cut answer for him. They said that we are worshipping idols. What's the big deal in worshipping idols? We, we will remain on these idols. We will remain worshipping the idols. What's wrong? So he asks them a question, hey, do you know what? هَلْ يَسْمَعُونَكُمْ إِذْ تَدْعُونَ أَوْ يَنْفَعُونَكُمْ أَوْ يَضُرُّونَ Do these things hear you when you call out to them? Do they hear you? Now they are getting agitated. Stop asking questions. Why? I need an answer. Give me an answer. We do sometimes silly things and we have no answers. And then when people ask us the question, we get irritated, agitated, and we become like violent. Or we want to start threatening. So he says, can they hear you? When you call out to these stones, do they hear you? Or have they ever benefited you? Or do they ever harm? Do they control anything? So they quickly answered, They said, no, we saw our forefathers doing this. So we will do it. 
We saw our fathers, forefathers doing this. We will do it. Here, I have obviously drawn the, the lesson to say we need to save ourselves by asking ourselves a question all the time. Remember, it is not bad to ask a question. If you really want to know, you've got to ask. There will be an answer. Keep on asking until you get a satisfactory answer. Keep on searching because you live on earth. Allah has sent the answers onto this earth. You will search for the answers. Inshallah, you will find them. And that is how you will earn your Jannatul Firdaus. That is how you will go into paradise. But if you were too scared to ask questions, you may never know. And the truth might have been right next to you. It was simple to ask someone, you know, I'm a bit confused about this. He might not know. Ask the next person the next person three four five people down the line you might get an answer one of the answers might confuse you a little bit you might want to still keep on asking a little bit there will be one that stands out because revelation supports it if it is an act of worship then that is your answer and if it is something to do with your general norms then you've got to see what was the life of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and how you as a muslim should be living and then you choose the way Accordingly, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and help us. So thereafter, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, what did he say? He made a dua. He asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so many things. And my brothers and sisters, when we want to save ourselves from ignorance, seek from Allah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't think that you are too intelligent, that you know you're going to do it all on your own. Together with your effort, ask Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, he spoke about how bad all of this is. He says, I cannot worship these sticks and stones and I cannot do as you are doing. All of this is enemy. It is wrong. It is foreign to me. The only one I worship is he who made me. Verse number 78, he says, yahdeen. Young man, young man teaching his people. He says, I will only worship he who has made me, he will guide me. The one who made me, whoever made me, I will worship him. And the one who feeds me and who quenches my thirst. Subhanallah. Look at the conviction. Brothers and sisters, we save ourselves from attachment to materialistic items by attaching to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you attach to Allah, you are distanced from material items. The more you detach from Allah, the more you will be attached to everything else. So this is why, remember, who feeds you? Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember one youngster asked me a few years ago, when, I, when we were talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I mentioned something of this nature, later on a young boy came to me and he told me, you know what, but my daddy feeds me. Now that's a common answer because he's young. I said, and who feeds your daddy? He says, he works hard and he gets a salary. I said, where does his salary come from? His boss. Where does his boss get the money from? He said, they do business. Look at how intelligent the children are, right? Then I told him, okay, who gave your boss and your father and you the eyes and the ears and the capacity and the strength to go? I want to show you so many people in the hospitals. They, are, they were better looking and more strong than your own father and then all your boss and his boss and everybody put together. But today they can't do anything. They are in bed. So who gave your dad this energy? He says the food he ate. And he says he goes to the gym and so on. So to explain, now this is a question, I cannot get upset because if I get cross with him, it's over. I need to explain to him, mashallah, in no time did he realize that ultimately it went back to Allah. Where did the food come from? The ground. Who put it in the ground? The rain came. Where did the rain come from? I'm stuck. I'm stuck, right? The rain came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He caused the plants to grow. Your father ate the food, subhanallah. However, whatever happened, he had the energy and so on. And this chain goes back all the way. It needs you to take time with the children to explain to them that you know what? It is Allah ultimately in total control. If he wants, he can stop it right now, subhanallah. He can stop it right now. Every one of us, and I'm sure the whole country is watching us because we've all heard about this huge gale force that is supposed to be hitting Cape Town. May Allah safeguard us. I think when we were reading Taraweeh this evening, wouldn't you agree with me? It was one of the most calm evenings we've had up to today. Look, everyone's nodding their heads. 
We bear witness. Nobody can tell you what Allah is definitely going to do. Yes, we take precautions and we will. But we will call out to Allah, Oh Allah, divert the worst of it from us. Let it go around. Allahumma hawa alayna wa la alayna. That is a dua. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let this rain and whatever is beneficial come around us, not necessarily on us. It's supposed to come onto the, uh, for example, the plantations and so on. I mean, if the rain hits me on my head, it's not like I'm going to grow. But what would happen is if it were to go to the right places, then definitely that is what is more beneficial. So we ask Allah for that. And I remember just as I was driving here, someone sent an image, an image claiming that it is Lambert's Bay. And it was, subhanallah, the gale force had already started and so on. Now we normally like to verify these things. Moments later, I discovered that picture was actually 2005, the hurricane Katrina in Florida. They took it and they said, look what's hit Cape Town already. We were here. There was nothing like that that happened. Be careful, my brothers and sisters. It is called a tahqiq. It is called authentication. No matter what you see today, even if it is a video, authenticated it could just be totally false fabricated photoshopped and you could be looking like a fool forwarding into the rest of the globe when nothing like that even happened now imagine if that is to do with dunya what about deen what about deen what about your religion imagine if dunya people are ready to deceive you think shaitan is not prepared to deceive regarding religion he will beautify things that are not in your deen for you to feel that this is my faith but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, go back, verify, ask questions, keep on asking questions, you will find the answers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it very, very easy for us. So he made a dua to Allah, to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he told the people, I worship the one whom when I am sick, he cures me. The one whom, when I, he will cause my death and he will resurrect me. Whoever he is, I'm worshipping him, him alone. That's it. As for these things, I don't understand them. They are not a part of me. So, subhanallah, he then says, The one whom I have hope in, that he will forgive my sin on the day of judgment. Him, I worship him. You know, as Muslimin, we say Rabbun. The term Rabb means the one who created me. Nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, the one in absolute control of every aspect of existence is called Rabbun. When we go out, in, when we go down in prostration, we say Subhana Rabbi Al A'la. We are praising, glorifying He who made me, who is the highest. So I'm saying, O oh, you who made me, I'm glorifying you, I'm praising you, you are the highest. Where am I right now? Well, I am, my head is on the ground for you. I'm on the lowest position. Subhanallah. Who did I worship? Whoever made me? And whoever I'm going to return to, oh you, whom I'm going to return to, have mercy upon me when I return to you. Subhanallah, this is worshipping Allah and Allah alone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the punishment of the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. May we be from among those who appreciate what the sujood is all about. And may we be from those who prostrate constantly for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Something very, very powerful. وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ Oh Allah, do not embarrass me on the day that you will resurrect me. Don't embarrass me. Imagine the embarrassment on that day. All of us have done things in our lives that are wrong. Every one of us. We have committed sin, different levels of sin. But we would be embarrassed if that was laid bare for the whole world and everyone to see what we did. So we say, Wala tukhzini yawma Oh Allah, do not embarrass us on the day that you will resurrect us. May Allah forgive our sins such that they are wiped out completely. Amin. You know, when you engage in repentance, even the angels are made to forget what has happened. So this is why my brothers and sisters engage in constant repentance. Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was a dua that Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam actually made. Thereafter, the verses end. Obviously the story that is here is make, making mention of what I've just said now. Later on, the story does not complete. It completes in other places in the Quran. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, in all of this, in all of this, there is a lesson for those, or there are signs for whom? Those with intellect, obviously. Indeed, in this, there is a sign. 
But Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ But most of them were not believers. Take a look at Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. The Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam was one of the highest ranking prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And nobody accepted his message initially. Nobody. A young boy known as Lut alayhi salatu was salam. The Prophet Lot, may peace be on him, accepted the deen. His wife accepted the deen. That's it. He had two people when he went away. He went to Harran, another area outside, subhanallah. Who, who were they? They were just a few people, two, three people walking together. That was him and his ummah, subhanallah. Yet when you think about it, subhanallah, he was one of the greatest of prophets. Allah loved him so much that after him, all the messengers who came after him, they were from his offspring. Did you know that? From his offspring. The amount of du'as that were made by Ibrahim alayhi salam need to be studied. My brothers, my sisters, we need to go through the Quran and look at the du'as of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He used to make du'a for his children, for his offspring, not just himself. When Allah says, we will bless you, he says, oh Allah, what about my offspring? Subhanallah. Immediately we say, Oh Allah, what about my dhurriya? What about my progeny? How many of us make dua for ourselves, let alone our progeny, for the deen? We are quick to say, Oh Allah, my son started a business. Let it be successful. Let him be a millionaire, so at least he can buy me a car. Let him be this, so that at least he can do this. But what about the dua, Oh Allah, grant my child steadfastness. Oh Allah, keep him on the path. Oh Allah, make him a person who earns Jannah. Oh Allah, make him a means of my entry into Jannah. Subhanallah. I remember one young man, he kept making a dua, Oh Allah, make my children a means of my entry into Jannah. And one of his sons passed away in a car crash. And he came to me and said, you know, I used to make this dua. I told him, Allah has answered your dua. He said, what do you mean? I said, the sabr that you will now endure because Allah took your child away, inshallah, it can be a means of your entry into Jannah. Subhanallah. So who said no? So he says, so was that a bad dua? Because obviously, if you're saying, oh Allah, make him a means of my entry into Jannah, and then Allah took him away. So I said, no, his date of death and time was written. Muqaddar. It's over. You cannot change it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you by making that dua. Allah gave you an opportunity to think about the sabr because many people become depressed when they lose their children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help those who've lost their children. It is a challenge. It is big. You will never understand what it's like unless you've been through it yourself. So we can keep on telling people, but we won't know what they have had to endure. So be careful when you address people, when you talk to them, be careful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannatul Firdaus. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُ وَالْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ We spoke about that yesterday, where we spoke about the izza and the rahma of Allah, the power and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah forgives even though He can punish. And this is the height of the mercy of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. Thereafter, we have a beautiful story of Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. And I'm not going to go into every detail of the stories because obviously we need to move on to the next ajza, inshallah. We're catching up with our recitation of the taraweeh to where I am. So inshallah, we hope to be moving in sync at a certain point. Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, you and I know that he too was a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who worked very hard. He did not give up. He worked with his people for 950 years. He worked with them. He lived for longer than that. But he called them for 950 years. How many people accepted his message? Do you know? Well, there are some narrations. Some say 11 in 900 years, 950 years. And some narrations take it all the way to 80. 80, the maximum. So if 80 people accepted his message, it means every 100 years, less than 10. That's the average. Every 100 years, less than 10. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannatul Firdaus. May we meet all these people who sacrificed for Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. They worked hard, imagine. And they did not lose hope. So one of the points that is being raised in this surah is very important. You see, with us in the masjid, you look around us today. We have white and black and tall and short and rich and poor. We are all seated together. We don't even know which nationalities we are. We might look at each other. We might take a guess maybe, but we don't know because it's irrelevant. Kulluna min adama wa adama min turab. We are all from Adam. Adam is from the dust. So it's 
It's not my business to actually know where you are from before I respect you. I respect you no matter where you are from because you are my brother. You are my sister in Deen. And this is why we are being warned by stories like these. Today you're going to look at the story of Nuh alayhi salam from a different aspect, a different angle. I tell you, we've always known about the flood. But let's go before the flood. The people told him, you know what Nuh, we're ready to accept your message. We are ready to accept, but... How can we accept your message when the poor people have accepted your message? We are wealthy. We are powerful in society. Look at those around you. They are cheap people, man. Verse number 111 of Surah Al-Shu'ara. They said to him, O oh Nuh, how can we accept when the lowest from amongst us, the, those who work, the working class and below, they are the ones who've accepted, who followed you. How can we now follow you? Now remember, when guidance and mercy of Allah comes, it comes to anyone who is genuine. When you are too attached to materialistic items, sometimes what did we say? You become detached from Allah. If Allah has blessed you with materialistic items, your test is to humble yourself and still to attach yourself to Allah, related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So imagine he answered them and he told them, you know what? I cannot do anything about this. I'm sorry. It is something I will not compromise. I imagine if it was subhanallah, may Allah forgive us, you're moving with someone and you want to go for a big meeting and then you look at the guy next to you and you say, you know, this guy is wearing tatty clothing. You know, let's tell him, you know, please, can you remain here? Let me go and see what's going on inside there. Just because he's not dressed appropriately or something. This is the deen. You cannot do that when it comes to the deen. Because with the deen, who is judging us is Allah and he will judge based on the heart. Inna Allah ta'ala la yanduru ila suwarikum wa la ila ajsamikum. Allah does not look at your bodies. Allah does not look at your, your, your wealth. Allah does not look at your physical features. He looks at your qulub and your a'mal. He looks at your hearts and your deeds. That does not mean I must wear dirty clothing because as a Muslim, I'm taught to wear neat, clean clothing. Neat and clean. But sometimes I might wear cheap clothing. It might have a few tatty, uh, you know, uh, portions on it. And it might not be looking that grand. I might not have had an opportunity to iron my clothing like everybody else. You know, a crisp beak on top of your scarf and so on. It might not happen. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to love one another no matter what. So he answers them. You know what he said? Verse number 113. إِنْ حِسَابُهُمْ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ رَبِّي لَوْ تَشْعُرُونَ وَمَا أَنَا بِطَارِدِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Their account is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you realize their account is with Allah? How can I chase them away? Now for your information, the kuffar of Quraysh told the same thing to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said that how can we accept the message when Bilal ibn Rabah is a follower of yours? The people who are our slaves, followers of yours. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to give them a response. And Allah has given this story in order to comfort Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say, you know what? It happened to those before you as well. It's not something new. It happened to them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says that Nuh alayhi salam says, Wa ma ana mu'minin. I'm never going to chase those who believe away, no matter who they are. This is why it is a sign of a good Muslim to embrace the others, no matter what color they are, no matter what financial condition they are in, no matter what standing in society they are in, to embrace them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all blessing. So remember this, my brothers and sisters, when Allah has written guidance for someone, he didn't look at their image. He didn't look at where they came from, what nationality. I have told you, and in the past, and I'm telling you again, I have visited some West African nations that blew me away with their dedication to the deen. And I always thought, subhanallah, that you know what, mashallah, we have masajid that we have filled and so on in our countries until I visited those. And I saw them to be more dedicated than some of the holiest places that we may be having. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all Jannatul Firdaus. You never know who you will see in Jannah. If you even get there, you will be surprised. Subhanallah, those whom you didn't even imagine would be there. This is why a mu'min should not even imagine. A mu'min should be worried about himself. Am I going to go there or not? If you get there, don't worry about who else is there. For as long as you are there, Alhamdulillah, you are fine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Now, they threatened Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. What did they say to him? They said, La illam 
تَنْتَهِ يَا نُوحُ لَتَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْمَرْجُومِينَ If you're not going to stop calling us towards worshipping one God, we are going to stone you. We will stone you. What did he say? Now he's helpless because up to now he was calling them. After 900 years, 950 odd years, they are starting to threaten him. Now was the time when he raised his hands to Allah. And I want to end off by saying, my brothers and sisters, when we harass people, let's save ourselves from harassing people. When we trouble people, when we harass people, they may not make a dua against us if they are patient. They will forgive you once. They will forgive you twice. They will forgive you three times. After that, be careful of them raising their hands because the hadith says, اتقي دعوة المظلوم فإنه ليس بينها وبين الله حجاب You should fear you should fear the dua made against you by he or she whom you have oppressed. For there is no barrier between that dua and Allah. Allah will answer it immediately and inflict the people with that punishment. Be careful. So save yourselves from oppressing people. Protect yourselves from a dua made against you by those whom you may have wronged. Apologize to them. Make peace with them. It is better for us, better for you. Inshallah, we will continue tomorrow. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.